So simple conversions like this are part of chapter one that were really important. Here's a word problem from chapter one. This is right out of the textbook, problem 1.76. It says a normal value for blood cholesterol is 200 milligrams per deciliter of blood. If a normal human adult has a total volume or total blood volume of five liters, how much total cholesterol is present? Okay. Um, so we have the question says, how much total cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is given in units of milligrams per deciliter. We're just going to get it in units of milligrams. Okay. That's, that's what the cholesterol is. Cholesterol is a solid. Um, so that's why it's conveyed in units of mass milligrams here. Blood is a liquid. That's why it's conveyed with units of volume. That's how we measure liquids. So start with 200 milligrams, and I like to label cholesterol, C-H-O-L, we'll abbreviate, per one deciliter of blood. All right, uh, now to use this other volume that it gives us, that one human uh, has five liters of blood, we need to be able to convert from deciliters to liters. Now, this is not one I've asked you to memorize, but there are 10 deciliters in one liter. I believe that's right. Like it's not one that I, it's not a unit I, or prefix I use very often either. So I'm going to convert from deciliters, 10 deciliters to one liter. And then I'm going to convert from liters to, we want to know how much total cholesterol is present in one human. So if you have a unit on bottom, it would be per, per human body. Okay, so then we'll say for every five liters of blood, that's one human. So deciliters cancel, liters cancel, and what you would get is 2,000 times five, we should get 10,000. Uh, milligrams and that's fine that the question doesn't specify what units we should put for cholesterol we can leave it in milligrams you could convert it to grams you could say 10 grams if you want of cholesterol all right so that would be our answer okay so uh, here's just an example this problem was an example of, of simple conversion problems really two or three steps here um, in, a, in a word problem form just knowing your prefixes using prefixes all right, uh, that brings us to chapter two. So those were the big topics from chapter one. Chapter two, uh, we definitely need to know atoms, the subatomic particles and their arrangement in, a, in an atom. And we need to understand how that affects groups on the periodic table. So remember for an atom that we have three subatomic particles. The first one is a proton and it has a positive charge. And we say it weighs about 1 AMU, which stands for atomic mass unit. Number two, we have a neutron. It is neutral, no charge. We say it weighs about 1 AMU. Number three, we have an electron. It carries negative charge. And we say it weighs zero AMUs, weighs nothing comparatively compared to the other subatomic particles. Now, where are the locations? It says, and their arrangement in an atom. So we need to know where these are located. Well, both of these things, protons, and if the atom has any neutrons, are gonna be in the nucleus. That is not how you spell it. Nucleus. There we go. I think that looks right. Okay. Uh, spelling is not my strong point if you haven't figured that out. Okay, uh, electron is going to be in the electron cloud, okay, surrounding the nucleus. So if we were to draw a picture of an atom and we were to draw the protons as um, blue, we would put the proton, the plus charges in the middle, and here's a little proton. And then if we, we were to draw the electrons as red, the electrons would be zooming about, okay, ar around in the electron cloud. All right, and then if we were to draw a neutron in as black, that would also be in the nucleus because the nucleus is the center 
of the atom. This is where all the mass of the atom comes from. And uh, the electron cloud is where the volume or size of the atom is made up, okay, due to the electron cloud. So know those, those uh, words and their charges and their masses and their placement and their role in the atom, okay? Uh, remember that we, we identify atoms based on how many protons they have, okay? And um, electrons are what are responsible for the chemistry of an atom, okay? So if I zoom in over here, the, the different roles these things have. So protons, P with a plus charge, these identify an atom, okay, ID, and they make up the mass of an atom. Uh, neutrons contribute to the mass of an atom, and they can be important for isotopes, which we are getting to in just a minute. And uh, electrons, these are what are responsible for the chemistry of an atom, okay? So that's just a little bit on subatomic particles. That brings us to isotopes, which is the next thing from chapter two. It's a great problem here, 2.42 to work regarding isotopes. First of all, remind yourself what um, an isotope is. It is um, an element with varying number of neutrons. This is the simplest way I can put it. Okay, so an element with varying number of neutrons. For example, carbon, okay? Carbon generally has six protons um, and six neutrons. That gives us um, carbon-12, all right? And then if it has six protons, we know that it has six electrons. That's another thing that I didn't mention in this above area up here, that the number of protons and electrons for a neutral atom are the same. We've got six protons here with carbon, we've got six electrons in a neutral atom. The moment they become ions, things are different. But we also have a, an isotope of carbon. We have carbon-14. Well, we know if we change the number of protons, then we're not talking about carbon anymore. So we still have six protons because we're talking about carbon. But to get a mass number of 14, which is what we're referring to the isotope by, the mass number, uh, that means we have eight neutrons. Still six electrons because it's a neutral atom. It's just an isotope because it has more neutrons, a different number of neutrons, okay? So look at that problem for isotopes, know about those things. Uh, what was next? Similarity and arrangement among groups and chemical behavior. So all that's saying is you need to understand and remember that um, things within the same group, and a group is a vertical column on the periodic table, not a horizontal row. So elements within the same vertical column or the same group, they're gonna behave similarly. Okay, we have certain names for different columns. Remember that group one and two, uh, we call the alkali metals or the alkali earth metals. Group two is the alkali earth metals. Group seven, we call the halogens. Group eight, we call the noble gases. All right, and uh, similarly, uh, group eight, any element in that group, um, it's gonna behave the same way in nature. They're very inert. They don't like to react with other things. Halogens are very reactive. Group one elements are very reactive. Um, so when I just, this point right here is, is hitting on those things. And that's, again, you can read about it in chapter two. You can go back to your notes. Uh, we lectured on that extensively. Okay, but the reason why that chemical behavior is the same for vertical columns all has to do with valence electrons. So these are the electrons in an element's outermost energy shell. So remember we can draw an atom like layers of an onion. If here is the nucleus, you can have layer one, layer two, layer three, depending on what row it's in. If it's on row three, it's going to have three energy shells. 
if it's on row four, it'll have four energy shells. But wherever that outer row is, okay, the electrons here, these are valence electrons. These are the electrons that can be traded. Okay, given or uh, they can be given away. I'm just going to erase that because that's kind of redundant. You understand what I mean when I say traded. All right, so an element will trade valence electrons in order to achieve um, a more stable state. All right, that is why electron, valence electrons are given away or received so that elements can become more stable. All right, so again, elements with one valence electron, they want to be like a noble gas. Everybody wants to be like a noble gas. They want to have eight valence electrons in their outermost shell if they can achieve that. Um, some can gain that quickly by giving away simply one valence or two valence, and those become your cations. And other elements can achieve an octet or be like a